Hi there. I'm back. Sorry for the absence. Oh, maybe I'll talk about that some other time. But today, what I want to focus on is reviewing or just talking about as many pieces of animation as possible in hopefully the shortest possible amount of time. Some of these are going to be more involved. Some of these are going to be pretty quick. And yeah, I just want to kind of find my footing again with the channel, get back into the swing of things, and we'll see. We'll see if I keep doing batch reviews like this or, or do more one-offs that are a little bit more... Uh, substantial, a little bit more fleshed out. Either way, I'm happy to be back here and thank you so much for tuning in. We're starting off with Trolls Band Together. And after watching this movie, it's clearer than ever that DreamWorks is ready to take things off the rails. So we all remember Puss in Boots The Last Wish, we were here for it, and after the fact, I think we all wondered whether that movie meant that DreamWorks would really have their future movies mimic that same amount of ambition so not necessarily use that same exact visual style and art direction that wouldn't make a lot of sense but if they would would give their new projects the same amount of of heft of of artistic uh, panache and shortly after the last wish of course we got ruby gilman which it is what it is. I feel like the story behind that one and its release has already been written. I also did watch Ruby Gilman finally. I, I won't be talking about it here. I honestly don't think I have too much to share of value about that movie. When Trolls Band Together released, which was I think about a year ago at this point, I just ignored it. And that wasn't for malicious reasons. I've actually been casually defending the Trolls franchise for a while now, mostly because I don't think that the movies deserve to be completely written off when, at least on a visual level, Level, there's absolutely a ton of work and skill going into them which automatically separates them from basically anything Illumination is doing, for example. Also, despite having all the usual hallmarks of a blatantly bad contemporary Hollywood studio children's animated feature, stuff like celebrity voice acting, it does hurt my face, hypersaturated colors, and tons of licensed pop songs, the Trolls movies have good performances, they have neat visuals, and I also think they're fun to watch. But I didn't watch this one, at least not until it showed up on Netflix over the summer, I guess, which is sort of a tradition for me. So what's the verdict on this one? If Trolls 2 was really stretching its legs, then Band Together is lying on the floor and doing weird, eccentric jazzercise routines. So let's pretend for a bit that the lore of the Trolls movies is something that matters. Like, either to the movies themselves, or to people who watch them. Trolls 3 adds so much so fast that it feels like a crossover with two or three completely separate cancelled projects. So, we had the Trolls and the Bergens originally. Those were the races we were dealing with. They used to be enemies, but they worked things out by the end of the first movie. The second movie was about, like, genre-based Trolls factions. So it was just different kinds of Trolls, as far as I remember, but also the Ron Funches race, who I think are aliens, Anderson Pack is among them, uh, and they, they sang a sad story about cultural appropriation, which was actually pretty interesting and good and totally out of the blue. Walking around like they were the geniuses, but it's only samples, auto-tune, and remixes. But still, mostly trolls. <laughs> the, 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 yeah, the second Trolls movie still had a bunch of trolls. It wasn't expanding that much. But now, we have at least two new races or like creature types in the world of, of you know, in the, the troll cinematic universe, I suppose. We have like Fraggle Rock puppets and we have noodle people with Play-Doh hair. And the new creatures also seem to have their own distinct cultures. The noodle people have like cars <laughs> and stuff and, and nightclubs. It feels so strange for a Trolls movie, which at least after the first movie, really felt like a Smurfs adjacent situation with just a bunch of tiny things living amongst nature. Now all of a sudden we have like, oh, there's there's a whole society over here that just feels vastly different from what we've seen so far. And even stranger than the new additions themselves is the fact that they don't seem to be necessary to the story. Not really. I guess they just add flavor. Unless it's actually referencing some really deep trolls lore like from the toys, but I, I really doubt it at this stage. The story itself is about the Justin Timberlake troll and his family, who was also a boy band, 
reuniting through the power of music, all to save their, their lead singer brother from the talentless noodle hacks who just milk him for his musical talent in a very literal way. The antagonists could have just been more trolls in this one. I don't think there needed to be an expansion of the world in order to tell this story, but the expansion itself is fascinating. Even just designing like whole new character types and their worlds must have been a massive amount of work. But then there's also the work of executing on those designs and most shocking of all, everything here looks fantastic. <laughs> Trolls 3 is going so deep into the franchise's own style that it's actually interesting now. This team knows that the visual strength of the franchise is just plain eye candy. So they took that stuff to the extreme. I guess they also realized that people liked the goofy 2D sequence from the second movie, I think. So they did another one here, but in its own style. And this is where we finally come back around to Puss in Boots, the good one, because I think we have our answer now. DreamWorks is pushing forward wherever possible. We can't expect every feature to hit out with some fantastic new look. It would be great if we could, and I think it would earn the studio just a whole new reputation if they did manage to do it, but I don't expect that to happen. They are choosing when and where to execute on a standout style. Regardless, while I don't think that we can expect this kind of panache in every movie, we can look forward to the DreamWorks movies that do have it. And in the meantime, Trolls Band Together is an entertaining family flick that's just great to look at. Scavenger's Reign is very good, and I don't want more. Actually, stop right there. It's been quite a while since I wrote this script here, so I don't know if I necessarily stand by that. I'll revisit that by the end of this section. And talking about the, the background of this this series is a little bit complicated. Uh, okay, so Scavenger's Reign was produced, uh, or distributed at least, by HBO, Time Warner, Discovery, whatever that company's name is by now. It got one season of 12 episodes, and then the big conglomerate canceled the show. Not such a surprise from them as, as we've learned in, in recent years. Then the company let Netflix license the show, and that licensing in and of itself is proof that Max doesn't really value the show very much. How often do you see HBO shows pop up on Netflix or any other streaming service for that matter? And apparently now Netflix gets to make the call on whether there's going to be a season two. So at the very least, there's a chance that Scavenger's Reign will get greenlit for a second season. The specifics are confusing and kind of stupid. And if the show did get a season two, I would be happy for everyone involved, but I'm not sure whether I would actually want to watch it, and that is despite the fact that, as a work of animation, Scavenger's Reign is objectively excellent. Premise. Corporate space cronies are stranded on an extremely hostile, but also not hostile, sometimes alien planet, and very slowly, various survivors try to survive some more, making their way to the landed ship, which has some frozen people on board. The whole thing is based on a short film, but don't worry about that right now. From the start, this thing is an incredible showcase of art direction and creature design, and right up to the end, those remain the best parts of the show. They're not the only good parts, but they are the best parts. Now, any long-term sci-fi fans will know that the genre is actually very diverse, or that it can be, or, or, or like that it has been diverse historically, and I, I'm not just talking about uh, uh, casting diversity, I mean like in terms of content and, and style and subject matter, all that stuff. The, but the thing is, lots of very popular, well-known sci-fi tends to homogenize, and so it becomes, ironically, very uncreative within a genre where there are literally no limits on creativity. A whole lot of sci-fi aliens basically look like humans. A whole lot of sci-fi worlds are basically the same as planet Earth. And that's not just a lack of creativity, I also think it's a practical storytelling decision. Especially for like mainstream movies and TV shows where efficiency of storytelling is extremely important. Now, explaining totally strange alien stuff that we can barely conceive of is generally not 
efficient. And if it's the, the human or the anthropomorphic, at least, elements of a sci-fi story that people are going to connect with when they actually watch it, then any attempts to really delve into the weird, non-human alien stuff would be counterintuitive, at least on paper. But unfortunately for me, I really hate <laughs> normal, old, stupid human drama, or shid as I call it. I really like non-human sci-fi. I want new stuff. And if a sci-fi story boils down to the same human conflicts that you would see in a regular drama, it feels sort of pointless to me. Scavenger's Reign almost breaks away from that norm. To be clear, Scavenger's Reign is more creative than whatever other sci-fi project you're thinking of right now, but it is ultimately about shid that I don't really care about. Though the stupid human drama is above average here, I want to make a note of that, it's just that all the non-human creatures, the robots, and even plants are immediately more interesting than the humans. Because I don't inherently understand the creatures. I don't know what to expect from them, at least at first sight. Whereas each human character speaks two lines of dialogue, and I know exactly what to expect from them. And on a technical level, that's that's good storytelling. That's efficient, that's effective. But the surprise is what's fun. <laughs> the novelty of brand new creatures is what's fun. I don't know, and that very basic and inherent understanding of the humans, the same goes for the story overall. I would say within the last four episodes especially, I had a pretty good idea of how things are going to shake out. But the planet itself, the environment, is a constant wild card. So if there's a bright side to this very unwieldy mix of predictable humans and completely unpredictable environments and creatures, it's that the show does a, a great job of balancing those two elements, which makes a lot of sense given the, the themes and potential messaging. I think the most interesting way to look at this show's theming, at least for me, is as a kind of response to solar punk or maybe like a realistic elaboration of solar punk, which is, uh, if you haven't heard of it before, basically an aesthetic and sort of halfway philosophy centered on a future of really technologically driven sustainability and, and harmony with nature. So while I don't think that the show rejects that ethos as a whole, even within my own subjective interpretation of it, I feel that it does have one of the most realistic depictions of a natural world and human interactions with it. So there are very romanticized views of the natural world that, that paint it as being endlessly beautiful and compassionate and, and giving and all these things. And there are more cynical views that see it as something to be conquered, something that's hostile, something that's, you know, not aligned with human interest. And of course, in reality, like it's, it's a combination of those two viewpoints, because really the natural world is just indifferent to human sensibilities, which makes perfect sense. But it's rarely depicted that way in media. But here, that's what we get. <laughs> Scavenger's Reign absolutely does portray this nature as indifferent. It, we, it doesn't have to have human ideals and standards projected onto it. Even though the creatures shown here are unambiguously predatory or ambivalent in relation to the human characters, none of their motivations are either positive or negative. Well, with with maybe one key exception. And I think that makes for interesting storytelling because while we, the audience, like or dislike the creatures we see based on whether they are nice or mean to the characters that we like, it would also be pointless to get mad at, at the ones we perceive as mean because they're not trying to be. <laughs> and something that makes the creature content of Scavenger's Reign even more fascinating is that it somehow manages to give us crazy non-human stuff, but it still avoids the inefficiency that I mentioned earlier. On paper, introducing so many different creatures, how they interact with the environment, and frequently expanding on or altering their portrayals later, that should be a big waste of time. But it's not. It never feels unnecessary or ancillary because it's completely relevant to the show's themes and its goals. And beyond that, the creatures are established so effectively almost always through visuals alone, that all of the wacky creature stuff ends up feeling efficient anyway. It just doesn't take up that much screen time, certainly not as much as it could have. And while I kind of want to move on from the creature and, and the world stuff, 
I'm not going to yet because this show is also a testament to the importance of art direction more generally. As animation fans, we are also fans of art direction, regardless of whether we're conscious of that or not. Art direction is just the, the presentation of a cohesive visual style. It's a look that makes sense within its own rules, its own terms. And yes, the, the humans in this show do have neat designs. In fact, I was kind of shocked to find out that this was not based on a graphic novel. They just very much have that look to me. But once again, it's the world, it's the flora and the fauna that showcase the team's talents and especially the talents of the show's art director, who I think is also a, a co-creator on the show. And I think he animated the original, but I'll have to check on that. Now, heading back to story, this is an HBO show, or, or was originally, and despite clear attempts to diversify their programming to some degree, HBO tends to have a very tight orbit. They attract certain audiences, they maintain a certain level of quality, and they contain a certain level of content that aligns with HBO's conception of what constitutes serious work, namely sex and violence. That's that's kind of their whole thing in a nutshell. And that stuff is here. Actually, very little sex, but plenty of violence. And more than that, what started to bother me was just the show's slightly edgelordy nature. Honestly, it reminds me of something that I felt a lot back in college where you had a bunch of kids essentially trying to be taken seriously, trying to find their own artistic motivations and, and voice and all that stuff. And one possible path that the students could take, myself included, when trying to be taken seriously was to include that kind of stuff, to, to mimic this the serious adult work that we see all the time that wins Oscars or that gets a, a ton of press attention. It gets talked about online endlessly. And there are times when Scavenger's Reign feels like it's trying very hard to be taken seriously, specifically within the frame of HBO and its typical audience. And that doesn't necessarily click with me because that is exactly the kind of thing that starts to lose my interest. And as I've touched on already, stupid human drama does end up being very important to the ending of the first season. And worse than that, without going into actual spoilers, there's some very heavy sequel bait at the end that teases an abundance of shit. <laughs> the kind that we've seen in the majority of work, sci-fi or otherwise, for literal centuries. I do want the show to have a second season, I'm not sure if I want to watch that second season if it focuses even more on the human drama and like factions and a slightly edgelordy hard sci-fi tone. I actually think that this show, this series, this IP, whatever, is tailor-made for short, satisfying vignettes across like a huge ensemble cast. I just want to see idea after idea after idea because that's the, those are the highlights of season one for me. But at the same time, that's my personal ideal. That doesn't mean anything. <laughs> that shouldn't drive what this show becomes if it is allowed to continue to exist. I'm not trying to convince you of what this show should become based on my personal preference. But the first season is nearly perfect on its own terms. And it would continue to feel complete and good even if it didn't continue to focus on dumb humans repeating the same human mistakes that aren't actually that interesting in the context of fiction anymore. So Scavenger's Reign is better than most things. It's already done some incredible work. The team has earned the right to more paychecks, <laughs> more time in the office. Sell plushies for this show, like I'm in. But given the nature of it, I can only get so close to this thing, and I don't expect that a second season would get me any closer than I am right now. It's a very easy recommendation, maybe not for all ages, but for anyone who's old enough <laughs> is willing to put up with this pretty intense content, absolutely. Watch it until the credits so that the show will actually have a shot. You don't even need to like it, but in my eyes, Scavenger's Reign has absolutely earned a huge amount of respect. I have zero background with Gundam, as in like my childhood familiarity with it growing up. Not at all. I, I did not get into it. 
I wasn't even presented with the option. I just, I just never came across it. And the only reason I decided to watch some Gundam movies was A, because that's a lot shorter than watching an entire season of one of the like 350 Gundam shows out there. And B, I recently bought and built some Gunpla on Impulse and really enjoyed it. So obviously I'm aware of Gundam just on the level of cultural osmosis. And I do think the vastness of the franchise is an advantage. When a property has lasted so long, that also means it has had a lot of opportunities to try out different things, different approaches and styles. And while it feels like a lot of ancient American media franchises like Star Wars and, and Spider-Man have wound up doing a lot of work that feels very similar, Gundam has absolutely taken those opportunities to change things up. For one, the timelines really do splay out quite a bit. There are very distinct eras in the Gundam universe, which also means distinct vibes for any given series or movie. They've seemingly involved lots of different creatives behind the scenes who obviously have different aims and techniques. And the franchise even expanded into a real world setting or something close to it with the Gundam Builder series, which is about people who build Gundam models competitively and fight them in like a weird AR game. Now to me, that amount of variety means that I am bound to like something in this franchise. There must be one of them that clicks with my tastes. And even though I won't be talking about all of the Gundam stuff that I recently watched, please keep in mind that I have now sampled about six different series or spin-offs and that was just within like a week. So I have at least some amount of perspective, but also the details of all these different things start to run together. So Mobile Suit Gundam Thunderbolt, December Sky, and Mobile Suit Gundam Thunderbolt Bandit Flower are compilation movies essentially of the first and second seasons of the Mobile Suit Gundam Thunderbolt show respectively. So these movies condense a season or a particular story arc from the associated show, and they also sometimes make big changes to the content of the story, either because it helps everything fit into the structure of a feature film, or I guess because they just feel like it. Now the first major Evangelion movie, for example, infamously changed the entire ending, supposedly to make it more comprehensible to the audience, since the original ending is basically a deep dive into the shallow end of a pool. Unfortunately, I can't compare December Sky and Bandit Flower to the story of the Thunderbolt series, since I haven't watched that whole series, but I can say that they feel extremely condensed and even rushed. Pacing is a big part of that for sure. It moves very fast, but it also has to do with the time scale. So in other words, it's pretty difficult to keep track of the time jumps and when exactly everything is happening. Maybe especially because we're in deep space, so we don't even have like a day night cycle to help us out. I also didn't have any context for where exactly in which timeline these movies are taking place and who exactly is fighting who, which is ultimately what every Gundam project is about, or at least, you know, the setup to every Gundam project. And the movies don't really bother explaining any of that in detail. Definitely not directly. So there's none of your standard sci-fi exposition. Things just happen and you have to soak it all up as best you can. And honestly, that lack of understanding was both good and bad for my viewing experience of these movies. And that's because the space politics that are so central to every single Gundam iteration are important and unimportant at the same time. Those details can be interesting, potentially, but other times the details just don't matter much at all because they're painted over by character drama and space battles and giant mechs. And of course the mechs are the real reason why this franchise still exists at all, more than any kind of high-minded messaging or elaborate timeline developments. So I don't actually mind that I'm just lost in the weeds of the Thunderbolt movies because I still have a good view of extremely intense mech battles and sweaty character rivalries. Similar to Gundam Seed, which I really like by the way, the Thunderbolt movies focus on two 
high level mobile suit pilot one on each side of whichever war is currently happening they are more or less evenly matched and the movies are either pitting them against each other or teasing another direct confrontation at all times unfortunately i didn't really care about either one of those characters so daryl the one with the afro generally gets more characterization than his blonde spiky haired counterpart eo fleming wow i would not have remembered that if i didn't write it down so i guess he's technically more likable but i wasn't invested except on the level of wanting them to stop screaming all the time another reason for that lack of investment might be the character designs themselves i really want to be clear on this both movies are visually stunning visually complex and dense as a frozen apple and the human character designs fit that art direction perfectly but these characters are also some of the ugliest that I've ever seen. I don't mean that in terms of like human beauty standards overall. I just hate looking at all of these characters, regardless of whether they are meant to be attractive or not within the movie's universe. But getting to the meat, the first movie is almost exclusively space battles. It's very intense. It's very dark. The second movie is drastically different, I think, with a variety of locations and really disparate goals. The two sides aren't necessarily in direct conflict with each other in that one. Instead, they're trying to oust like a problematic cult down on Earth. The two protagonists don't really interact at all, if I remember correctly, and their stories are mostly separate. So that whole rivalry is just pushed aside. And I'll say now that the second movie is my favorite of the two by far. The action choreography alone is absolutely fantastic. We also get to see the pilots doing some genuinely smart and creative things rather than just being really good at shooting with space guns or like yelling while holding a space sword. The different locations are also a really welcome change. The cult in that movie is creepy and interesting. We get some new characters who feel like they're straight out of Starship Troopers. There's a lot of cool stuff about that second movie. Unfortunately, that movie ends on a hard cliffhanger, apparently because the manga artist behind the series had to quit for health reasons, which is shockingly common. And so I don't ultimately have that many compliments for the story itself. It feels like a long episode of a show, despite being a summary of an entire season. But basically, visually stunning movies, incredibly fun to watch on that level. The story is harsh. The story is incredibly dark, uh, gory, desperately violent, <laughs> almost mean-spirited in a way. Still worth it somehow, I think. They're absolutely still standouts within all of the, the Gundam universe, all of the spin-offs, all of the series that have been produced so far. Also, I got a model kit of the Psycho Zaku from these movies. There it is. This was a whole thing. Kung Fu Panda has just never clicked with me. I don't even remember what my reaction to the first movie was back at the time of release, which probably means that it was a negative reaction or just very blasé. As a franchise, it offers some pleasant stereotypical like ancient Asian environments, I guess. Those can be nice. And I also think that Jack Black starring in an animated feature was way back when a novel and mildly amusing concept. But of course today, Jack Black's performances in these movies feel like the epitome of bad celebrity voice acting, just like every role he's played since High Fidelity. He's just doing his usual shtick, which isn't the least bit funny or appealing to my comedic or animation sensibilities. So to see that Kung Fu Panda movies have continued to be vehicles for Jack Black copy paste jobs is pretty disappointing especially since i just talked about how trolls another franchise that dreamworks seems really committed to is doing interesting things despite its lack of an interesting premise i watched kung fu panda 3 and 4 on the same day and to be completely honest there wasn't a lot to hook me it seems that the only consistent thread through the entire franchise is that poe is doing things and trying to improve, I guess, just trying to find himself. And you could maybe argue that the relationship between Fo <laughs> Poe and his father's is also pretty consistent. And that's also the core of movie three, which introduces Poe's biological father. But generally speaking, Poe is absolutely 
not interesting enough as a character to support an entire franchise. But on the surface level, Poe is the franchise. He is the Kung Fu Panda. And if you ask the average person about this series, they would probably know more than anything else that Jack Black is in the movies. That's really all this franchise is, as far as I can tell. The, the stories don't really seem to have anything for me. As with all DreamWorks movies, they are of professional quality. They look nice, the environments are nice, the character designs are all right. And judging by movie four, Kung Fu Panda's level of involvement in this new era of DreamWorks art direction is basically just some brushstroke accents for like character introductions. Also, four is better than three, I can say that. Aquafina plays a criminal fox who ends up betraying Poe and then unbetraying him thanks to the power of friendship. I know there's a lot to say about Aquafina and her role in pop culture, but it's still funny to me that while a lot of celebrity voice actors are celebrities first, and then they transition into voice acting off the strength of their overall fame, Aquafina feels like she was always destined to be a celebrity voice actor just from the start. Despite the fact that she's done plenty of live action, and despite her voice acting being pretty decent, albeit in its own copy-paste style from role to role. And here there is nothing in particular to say about her performance or even her character. Apparently Poe has gone from being the student to being the teacher, mostly because other people tell him it's time to switch for reasons, and Aquafina Fox is the new student apprentice character essential to so many martial arts movies and apparently to the Kung Fu Panda franchise. I clearly do not understand the appeal of these movies, though I guess the duration of the franchise could be its own source of appeal. Kung Fu Panda got started in 2008, meaning it's only seven years younger than the Shrek franchise. And while the Shrek franchise has spun off basically and will maybe be revived soon, it's been dormant for quite a long time. Kung Fu Panda's still here. So if you, get, if you got started on Kung Fu Panda way at the beginning, I could see the comfort of just familiarity, but that is not my relationship with the series. And while I'm sure that it will continue, I'm not that invested. <laughs> I'm not that invested in whatever happens next, unless it really turns a corner and finds its own wacky visual style. But until then, uh, I just don't think it's for me. I don't think it's bad, but it's not for me. I saw the trailer for Migration ahead of the Mario movie, and I think I made fun of it in that video, and rightfully so. The premise of this movie is nothing. It's about a family of ducks migrating the way that, that all the other ducks do. In relation to human movies, it's a road trip storyline, basically. Illumination are industry leaders in basing movies around the most simple, most broadly appealing subjects. Animals will always be popular with children. Plenty of adults retain a love for animals, and there's no copyright, there's no trademark on animals, so let's make some movies about animals doing stuff. In this movie, the animals sing pop songs that were popular when the production cycle started. In this movie, the animals do animal things, interrupted by goofy fiascos that I guess are meant to be entertaining to someone. And yeah, this movie is exactly what I expected, and outside of maybe lighting tech and some more elaborate action sequences, this feels like a direct-to-video movie. That's just the level of quality, flat out. There is nothing about the movie that makes it special. I can't think of a reason to recommend it to anyone. I, I don't know why someone would be motivated to watch this movie outside of just wanting something that's vaguely upbeat background noise. And even then, there are thousands of other mediocre animated movies to choose from. There is nothing about migration that makes its superior background noise or even above average background noise. I already have a dislike for animated movies that take place in some version of the boring real world. You could have set your story anywhere and you chose a pond, New York, 
and Jamaica. But it's still possible for a real world animated movie to be great in spite of its setting. It could have like a great story or great characters or just do anything interesting at all. And unfortunately, migration doesn't do any of those things. The characters are stock archetypes, which I guess is a, a storytelling efficiency choice when you're not gonna spend any amount of time developing those characters. The story itself is just a road trip with a weird amount of focus on the duck parents failing marriage. The only notable thing I can think of to say about migration is how it chooses to compete directly with other major animated features and then manages to lose every single matchup. So in its road trip movie structure, it loses out to Goofy Movie and even Mitchell's versus the Machines. In its depiction of a farm where birds are treated to some good times, oblivious to the fact that they'll soon be slaughtered, it loses out to Chicken Run, Dawn of the Nugget. And in its weak, very short, and underdeveloped stealth sequence of an animal in a fancy kitchen, it gets absolutely shamed by the first third of Ratatouille, which is what, around 15 years old at this point? The real kick in the gut was seeing that this movie was directed by Benjamin Renner, who also directed Ernest and Celestine, one of my favorite animated movies and one of my favorite movies of any kind. I really hope he uses this paycheck to do some work that does not feel anything like this movie in any way. I don't see any stamp in migration. There's no signature. There's no suggestion that anybody on the team actually wanted to do this. And that's where I'm gonna leave it because I don't think migration deserves any more of our time. I watched the Emoji Movie on a whim and yes, it's bad. I had never seen it before, but I definitely remember the condemnation of the movie at the time of release. It was such easy pickings for self-serious internet movie critics with large followings, which at least part of that isn't me, I guess. It's so obviously stupid that it feels unnecessary to deliver any kind of detailed criticism, but I guess I'm gonna give it a shot. Uh, okay, if you somehow avoided it up until this point, the premise is that individual emojis have, they always have to be one thing which isn't a conflict of any kind for the emojis that are just inanimate objects, but the face emojis have to do the same amount of work to make the face they're supposed to make when the phone user wants to use that emoji. So when TJ Miller's character, by the way, did he just stop being in movies after this? I, have, I haven't seen him in like anything. Uh, when his character doesn't do the right face at the crucial moment, he has to go on the lam to try to escape the phone via the very popular enterprise productivity software Dropbox. The arc is that no emoji should need to feel confined to the identity they were assigned at birth, but the movie doesn't use that angle to get into any kind of interesting gender identity stuff at all, or just identity stuff. If anything, it feels more like a suburban story of like petty personality repression as typified by the Anna Ferris character who's a princess emoji that would rather dress like an embarrassing hacker stereotype from the 90s. The parallel story is about the phone user himself who's a kid who wants to tell a girl that he likes her but he's feel, you know, he's peer pressured against using words very explicitly at the beginning of the movie. So his story aligns just barely with the main plot in the form of like learning to be yourself, I guess, but the kid isn't a real character and his climactic choice involves very little choice. The emojis do all of the work for him. This movie is the poster child for IP first studio filmmaking. Just building an entire movie around anything at all that lots of people are aware of. There are only so many old media icons to pillage at this point, and those rights got divided up years ago. So Sony settled on the concept of emojis. From there, career filmmakers were tasked with building a story just out of a concept. You know, they didn't do a good job, but they did a job. They made a movie they probably knew was gonna suck, and it did. So did this movie start something or did it end something? Is Cocaine Bear a direct result of the Emoji Movie? Have major movie studios learned not to be so transparently vacant? And did the internet's whining do any good when the professional reviews probably had a bigger impact anyway? Probably not. 
And did even the professional reviews have any real impact, given that this thing still made money, and Sony does not seem especially concerned with critical consensus to begin with? I don't think it's worth watching even out of curiosity, and I did not gain any extra insight by watching it myself. Enough said. All right, the, the next few movies are probably going to be really short discussions because I don't have any script at all for them. I'm just going to share some thoughts on the fly. First up, we have the One Piece films Gold and Red. In terms of the show itself, I'm barely up to episode 500, I think big story arc happening right now. But I'm not here to talk about the show. Just these two particular movies, which are far apart, they're not sequential. <laughs> and it's sort of strange to think about this now because when Film Red came out, it got a lot of buzz, at least in the, the US press, the Western press, and it was apparently breaking a certain number of records in relation to anime movie box office stuff, even though ultimately those revenues were quite low. Like, it, it's not like One Piece Foam Red was at the top of the box office for any length of time in the US. So, uh, the, the extra bit of irony there is that to me, Film Red absolutely pales in comparison to film gold really quickly the the premise of each movie in red luffy and all his buddies the whole crew is out to see like a weird pop show <laughs> they're going to see a pop concert on some island and luffy turns out to to know the star the the artist leading the show and everybody's just completely gaga over her and then things happen there's conflict there's drama uh, ultimately fell flat for me. One Piece film Gold is when <laughs> Luffy and his friends all go to a giant ship that's one enormous casino and is also like an independent nation. Like it's free of all legal authority anywhere in the world. It's a giant casino. Oh no, they get stuck there. They lose some money after some shady dealings and they have to figure things out. There's conflict, there's drama there's big fights and obviously like i don't know i don't want to reduce it too much but i will say that one piece overall is it's about the big fights it's about the big crazy shonen fights where all the cool characters get to use their own cool powers to do cool things and beat people up but only for good reasons they're not being mean about it there is more to, to the franchise than that, absolutely. I do think a lot of the character work is, is pretty decent. The the scope of the project overall is just insane, you know? Like, I, I sometimes describe it as like, what if your favorite show, your favorite adventure show from childhood just never ended? What if the Avatar team just continued forever they never stopped having adventures they're all there they're still alive they're hanging out they're having a great time that's what one piece is and it makes it absolutely fascinating to watch even if it's not something you grew up with yourself there are other great things about the franchise but those big fights <laughs> the screaming the yelling the punching, the stretching, the hitting. That's what we're all here for. And in the show, it can easily take 20, 30 episodes, maybe even 50 episodes to build up to some enormous fight, some enormous showdown. And in a movie, it's very efficient because you know you're gonna get it after two hours, maybe just an hour and a half. And yeah, both of these movies absolutely deliver on that front. You do get crazy, overly dramatic battles at the end, and that's how everything gets resolved. Good. Absolutely. But again, I don't know. Film Red tries really hard to integrate just like contemporary pop, even like v a VTuber vibes to a certain extent, and it doesn't click with me at all. The character work for that new character specifically doesn't quite click and does feel shoehorned in. It, it feels like something that is meant to be as broad as possible, which, okay, this is arguably the most popular anime property in history. It has earned the right to be as broad as possible in its appeal. That's what the whole thing is. But still, uh, Film Red felt trend chasey to me in a weird way and in a way that I don't think is going to age gracefully at all. It's very much a product of its time. The visuals do look fantastic, but it's, it's not 
I don't know, it's not enough for me to recommend the movie on, on that alone. Where I think gold surpasses red <laughs> is just, I don't know, extreme concentration of its premise, its, its theming, its visual motifs, its overall vibes. It's fascinating to look at and just see the, the number of ideas they had <laughs> for like the most insane casino you could ever conceive of. The cause they're fighting for is, is about much more than themselves. It feels believable, it, it feels heartfelt. Sorry, bad sentence. Regardless, I'm, I'm with it all the way. I'm rooting for the team. I'm even rooting for some of the new characters that they've introduced just within the first, you know, 30 minutes or so. And come to think of it, the disparity between these movies in terms of their their resonance with, with me as a viewer and just overall entertainment value is absolutely in alignment with the story arcs of the main show itself. I'm not going to get into spoilers. I'm not going to name <laughs> specific arcs just in case you're thinking of getting into it now, but that's just how it goes. There will be arcs where you're like, oh, I don't care, and I know it's gonna be 50 episodes, maybe more, before they move on to something else. If you're unlucky enough to dislike one of the story arcs that basically stretches over the entire series or keeps bringing back characters you just hate, bad luck. You just kind of have to deal with it. At the same time, there are those storylines, those environments, those new characters that just do the exact opposite. That are just like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. This is so fun. It's so compelling. I feel like I'm going along on an adventure with the whole crew. I'm having a great time. And without having seen all of the other One Piece movies so far, or without having seen the other 500, 600 episodes of the show that I still have left, I'm going to guess right now that that stays true for everything. I'm gonna guess that that would be my approach, that that would be my, my feeling about the different storylines and about the different uh, spin-off projects. We'll have to revisit that in the future, <laughs> come back to this, see if I turned out to be right. And so while I'm not going to say, oh, for you specifically, this is the good one, this is the bad one, watch this one, don't watch this one. No, our, our tastes are different. You might like red so much more than I did, and you might hate gold for completely different reasons. That's all fine. But in, in sort of a, I don't know, a more general recommendation, I can say that if it feels like any individual part of the One Piece franchise would appeal to you for any given reason, you're gonna get stuff you love. Shrek 4 Forever After. I was curious, okay? I was curious. It was This movie was streaming. I, I don't think I'd ever seen it available for streaming before, or at least I was never interested in rewatching it before, but this time I was. I subjected myself to Shrek 4 colon Forever After. Wow. Uh, I think I mentioned earlier about something feeling direct to video. This is the epitome. It, it feels small. It feels small in scope. It feels small in terms of ambition, despite the fact that the, the premise of this movie is kind of a big deal. Shrek essentially erases the timeline of the first three movies, of course, only for it to be reset at the end. Spoilers, which makes it feel like everything was a waste of time, which it was. It just feels so insignificant and feels so uninteresting to me overall, and it's one of those things where, just a personal preference, but any time the catalyst for a, a, a movie's story is something that could have been easily avoided, and the whole movie is just doing a ton of work to catch up to where you were at the start, I hate it. I hate it so much. I think it's I think it's mostly my anxiety talking, but I, it's something I think about constantly. I was like, oh, what if a really bad thing happened? And it would be another 10 years before I could just get back to where I am now. Like, it's it's a horrifying <laughs> concept. In movie form, in storytelling form, there's, there's nothing there for me. It just makes me frustrated, generally. And that is how I feel watching Shrek 4 colon Forever After. Maybe the more interesting aspect here is to reflect on where the Shrek franchise proper, the, the mainline series, left us, and what it could mean for the apparently inevitable revival of the Shrek series within the next few years. So first of all, this movie was released, 
was it 2010? I don't have to tell you that that was a long time ago, and it feels like a long time ago. In a different era of, of filmmaking, a different era of the Hollywood system, that long of a gap between entries in a series would actually mean that it was dead. Like, they're not coming back to it. There aren't going to be any more movies in this series. The, the era of filmmaking we're living in now means that nothing is allowed to die. Nothing can go away forever because there's some potential value. <laughs> there's some revenue potential in anything that people recognize, in anything that people once cared about. And of course, with Shrek, lots of people still care about it for either nostalgic reasons or just they, they really connect with those original stories. Probably the first two movies more than anything else, but still. There's a fan base, even an ironic fan base and a meme, a meme-centric fan base around Shrek as a whole. There are, there are tons of reasons, tons of practical, realistic reasons why they would want to bring this thing back. I just honestly don't know whether the team who gets assigned to it, whoever they may be, I don't know if they're up to it, and I don't honestly know what you could do at this point. I think a new Shrek movie would really have to find a new way to be subversive, a new way to put itself in stark contrast against the norms of contemporary Hollywood animation. Which is possible. There, there, you know, there are norms. There are ways to subvert those norms. But if we extend this a little bit further and think about other animated properties that were successful specifically because of their subversion, because of feeling different and, and rebellious and creative and unique and original when they first came out, how many of those have managed to do the trick again? How many of those have managed to come back around and say, oh, we're weird again, but for completely different reasons? Shrek 4 Forever After is kind of worth watching if you're really hard up for something to watch in general. And if you do have a history with the series or if you never managed to get that far into it in the first place, just for the, the cultural context of how Shrek died as a franchise, there's still potential for necromancy, but I'm not holding out hope. Okay, my voice is really starting to go. This is all basically in one shot. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm working on another thing for the channel. It's on the way. I'd love to, to get back into things and, and join you guys again. Thank you so much for sticking around. Um, hope you've been having a great year so far. I feel like that's how long it's been. And I'll see you again soon. Thanks for stopping by.